For Krima Media in Johannesburg, this is Sanet Lamini. Joining me today is political analyst Mpumele Lomkabela to discuss his book titled The Enemy Within, How the ANC Lost the Battle Against Corruption. So, Mr. Mkabela, a few years ago, the PEN South African Language Board said that the word state capture was the word of the year for 2017. What prompted you to write about the corruption within the African National Congress? Well, as I explained in my book, um, I uh, say that the book is an outcome of what I call political necessity. So, in other words, it's necessary for... South Africans or anyone who is interested in what's happening in South Africa to understand the, the main reason why we're having the big, one of the biggest challenges we have, which is corruption. I basically center around the role of the ANC as a governing party in dealing with corruption. So I track from the beginning when the ANC got into power up to the point where we have what you correctly say state capture the word in vogue in terms of corruption leading to the Pan South African Language Board declaring it the word of the year in 2017. So I, I track that whole thing. What happened? What went wrong? It's something which everyone should be interested in, in understanding. So I am not saying I'm offering all of the reasons and, and the whys and the hows, but at the very least, I'm trying to help people understand to be able to interpret things as they happen so that they can make their own judgment about actually what is the reason why we find ourselves in this situation where uh, corruption has reached that stage, the highest point of which has been state capture, as you correctly point out. And uh, after reading the book, I felt as if you were also like taking us through uh, the journey of the ANC from when it took power to until now, as they are preparing now for one of the biggest uh, conferences before another elections. You are also reflecting on an important decision in your book, Mr. Mukabela, that the ANC had to make uh, two years ago. They had to make a, a decision that had to impact the political journey of our country. Can you briefly reflect on that? Yes, that's a, a two and a half years uh, of the ANC being in power. Mm. Um, that was the time of uh, the Nelson Mandela administration. And um, the, I call that chapter the first test because that's basically the first time when the ANC was tested on how it will deal with corruption. And it faced this dilemma, which I argue should have been very easy for the ANC to deal with at that time because the ANC was still at the high moral um, it, it rode uh, into power using high moral, high ground, a party that was going to undo the sins of the National Party, which was basically a very corrupt party presiding over a very corrupt apartheid system. So the ANC had given itself the task to undo that and to basically inject a new uh, um, morality in our politics. But when they were confronted with that, they wavered uh, mm -hmm. because they chose the side uh, of the person who was accused of corrupt corruption at the expense of the person who was making allegations of corruption. And that's basically how Bantu Holomisa was expelled from the ANC. And in chapter three, where you now discuss the anti-corruption gospel, according to former uh, President Tabumbegi, you believe that the society's prevailing values had been inherited from the apartheid. Tell us about that. That chapter, basically, I, I tried to review and critique um, uh, former President Tabombegi's stance on corruption. Mm. And to his credit, he has actually done a lot to deal with corruption. He philosophized about it, he analyzed it, he lectured it in, in various lectures. Um, he, he was he really obsessed about the problem and, and we should give him credit for that. He also made sure that various pieces of legislation were passed in parliament to deal with basically the, the corruption and also general financial management um, of public finances uh, in the country. So you during his time, for example, you had laws like Municipal Finance Management Act, uh, Public Finance Management Act, the legislation that established the Scorpions, and also the most important piece of uh, legislation in terms of corruption was the Prevention and Combating for Corrupt Activities Act, which was passed in 2004. All of those things happened during his time. But one of the things, to, to your point, one of the things he, he, he referred to in many of his lectures was that society had sort of imbibed these corrupt values. And mm. they were such that people have gotten to the point where they believe that they had to be corrupt, for example, to live certain standards of life. And then also that the market economy, what you call uh, the market fundamentalism, basically mm. buttressed those values because 
the desire for material well-being, the desire for profit making basically became more important than anything else. So people were driven by that type of ideology, that's those type of values to be corrupt. And then it makes a historical case uh, around that. But one of the things that I say, notwithstanding all of the, the correct analysis and the good things it did, but I go on to critique what went wrong uh, with all of the right things it did, what then went wrong with corruption, because surely it should have been stopped or it should at least have been managed down. But instead, corruption increased. Uh, mm. The incidence of corruption increased in terms of frequency, in terms of monetary value, and in terms of the extent to which they were they're so high profile in society. So I tried to, to, try to, to, I tried to deal with the situation. So how did that happen, given the fact that the president had put the matter at the top of the agenda and had mm. also done something to deal with it. And then that's where I critique him to say where he fell short. Still on, on Tawam Begi, you are also telling us in the book about this one uh, story of a businessman who approached him uh, out of frustration. And I'm sure this has been common now in the country. You are now saying in the book that his business idea was killed by really comradeship. Do you think that this rot will ever be eradicated? I think it's possible to eradicate it um, because there are people in the country who are fighting against uh, corruption. Mm -hmm. So what is required here is for the fighters uh, of corruption to basically win against the corrupt. And the ANC has had these two types of people uh, 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 fighting each other almost. So they're corrupt and and the one fighting against corruption. Mm -hmm. And what has happened over the years, and that's what I'm trying to uh, try to analyze in the book, that typically the one who is uh, accused of corruption has tended to get a lot of political support than the one who is fighting corruption. Mm. So what you need basically is to flip things around. The one who is fighting corruption must win and must be the one who gets supported by the party. And he must be the one who gets a lot of support generally in government, in society, everywhere. And the one who is corrupt must not be supported. But what we have seen in the ANC, uh, you can, uh, lots of scandals you can mention. I mean, the most recent scandal is the one of Zandi Lekumete in Eteguin municipality. Yeah. She had been charged with corruption, but the ANC in that uh, region of Eteguin decided to make her the chairperson, notwithstanding the fact that they know her, that she's been charged of corruption. You might think that it's almost as if the ANC has no options. But the truth is that there are options. The ANC has a lot of people that are not corrupt. But those people are, are not dominating in the leadership positions. That's why a lot of them get kicked out. A lot of them don't get anywhere. Um, and those that are corrupt, that are able to use public money uh, to finance uh, their political campaign in the ANC, they tend to win. So the ANC then becomes a battle where it's about whether you can raise money to fight for a leadership position. And how do you raise money to fight for leadership position? Most of the people who, who get into leadership positions do so by securing money through corrupt means. Basically, they use the state to finance their own campaigns in the ANC. So corruption becomes self-propelled. For the battle against corruption to be won, the ANC needed to take the side of the people that are fighting against corruption or the people that are not corrupt. So far, it has not done that decisively. So you find Zandile Gomete being supported, for example, to the point where she becomes a chairperson of a, the biggest region in the country for the ANC. And then you have, during the time of John Block in the Northern Cape, when he was undergoing trial, there were people outside court, hands off John Block. When the judgment was issued against him and he was sentenced to 15 years, you don't find a statement from the ANC that is strongly in support of the judgment. Because here is somebody who sort of didn't live up to public expectations. But the ANC wavers. Every time when it's challenged, it wavers. Tony Engeni notwithstanding the corruption that he was accused of and was found guilty of and was sentenced to jail, he later on was elected to the National Executive Committee of the ANC. So those are some of the examples I tried to analyze to get into detail how did it happen Mm. that the party can be so consumed by corruption to the point where literally people don't believe the party can actually can talk about corruption and deal with it. It's almost as if when they talk, they don't mean what they are saying. They're talking about... uh popular corrupt leaders uh, the ANC in KZN 
This weekend, they visited a former statesman, Jacob Zuma, to seek advice from him on what is going on in the party and in the province. So now in Chapter 8, you, you are also speaking about Jacob Zuma having a split character, which was interesting. You identified him as a fighter. And at the same time, he was also seen as a perpetrator in some of the corrupt dealings uh, within the party and government during his tenure. This is an interesting way of analyzing his character. Tell us about that. You would see through the book, I, I, there's somewhere where I, I draw up a chart and I try to analyze uh, his statements against corruption vis-a-vis -vis other presidents. Mm. And uh, when I use the criteria of the State of the Nation address and also the January 8 statement uh, of the ANC, mm. yeah, overall, I came to the conclusion that in terms of words spoken, in terms of rhetoric, like concern, Zuma was actually the most concerned leader when it came to corruption. He was very worried about corruption. That's in terms of words. But in terms of what he did, it's totally different. So here I try to deal with the two characters of Zuma, the one who is concerned about corruption and the one who actually behaves corruptly. So, and I deal with the fact that um, it's basically how he exercised his authority. In government and in the ANC as a leader, he held particular authority by virtue of the office he occupied or the offices he occupied. So he could instruct people to do certain things and all of that. So from strictly legal point of view, he was the kind of a guy who would sign uh, proclamations, for example, for corruption to be investigated. He would talk about corruption. He will do all kinds of things, address conferences against corruption and those things. But when it came to um, the other things he was doing, which is another form of exercising authority by way of example, so what he was doing, that he was giving uh, people some kind of authority to act mm. by doing. He was actually authoritatively telling them to be corrupt by his actions, not by his words. So mm. I tried to grapple with that character uh, of Zuma. That's what that chapter is all about. I wrestled with how can somebody who says a lot of things about corruption, fighting against corruption in words, and then mm. act differently. So that's my analysis of that chapter. How does that happen? And Zuma really provides a very interesting case study. Looking at the party now, what do you think is needed to renew and revive the ANC? There are three scenarios that I'm I'm, I'm looking at, uh, which I also mentioned in the book. One scenario is that the ANC could uh, cleanse itself if it were to expel all members that um, have been uh, implicated in corruption. So if it were to get off all of those people, it would stand a chance to uh, basically be back on track as the party that could be trusted. Mm. The second scenario is that the ANC loses elections um, and it's no longer in charge of government. And when it's outside government, perhaps it can sort itself out because it won't be attractive to the people that are corrupt. Mm. And that scenario is uh, people like Halema Motlant have spoken about it in the past. The other scenario, which is the one I tried to focus in the book to say this is perhaps where South African politics is going, is one where we have now entered a new struggle. And I call that struggle the post-94 struggle, or if you like, the post-ANC struggle. So I distinguish between the anti-apartheid struggle, which led to the foundation of democracy that we have right now, and this struggle, which is basically about defending the democracy that we have. So what happened between the time of the struggle against apartheid and now is that so many people that sacrifice their lives, sacrifice their, sacrifice their youth, sacrifice their families to be in the struggle, have themselves become corrupt over the period while they were in government. So they can no longer defend the very same democracy they fought for. So what now is happening is that there are new people that have emerged that are prepared to die. They are prepared to basically lose their lives. They are prepared to lose their, they are prepared to go to exile. They are prepared to do uh, the very kind of sacrifices that the former liberation heroes undertook. Mm. So basically to defend the country this time around, to defend democracy. So this new struggle, I mean, one of the, the among the people that you would say are part of this struggle are the whistleblowers. So they are prepared to die. Um, they know, I mean, if you think about people like Papita Teokoran, for example, in Houting, who knew that what she was doing could lead to her being killed. And she mm. said that. And, and But nevertheless, she continued to do her job. So I find similarities between people like that and the people that were there during the liberation struggle who were prepared to die. They knew that participating in the struggle could mean 
they could be hanged, could mean they will be on Robben Island. They could be mm. punished and they could be pushed to exile. They could be detained without trial. Mm. But they still insisted on the struggle because they were not fighting for immediate material gain. They were fighting for the bigger cause. So we now have those values of the former liberation heroes now being found in new kinds of people that have now emerged, that are now fighting for uh, the preservation of democracy and human rights in the country. So this is the new struggle that we're undertaking now. I don't say in the book where this struggle is going to end, but I'm merely highlighting it that actually it has begun. And you also say there is an enemy within uh, the ANC, hence the title of this book, that makes it hard for the party to fight the scourge of corruption. Can you explain that? In the past, the ANC used to have enemies. Uh, in fact, the bigger enemy the ANC was fighting alongside other liberation movement was the, basically the apartheid system. Mm -hmm. That was the enemy the ANC was fighting. It was the enemy of the people. But within the apartheid system, there were other enemy forces. For example, you had the intelligence that would infiltrate liberation movements, basically to sow divisions, or to kill people, or to convert other people to Ascaris and all of that type of thing. So those were like the enemies uh, of the ANC, but the overarching enemy was the apartheid system. After the apartheid system, democracy became the political system with the ANC at the helm, right? And the human rights was basically at the heart of the democratic dispensation. And you would have expected that the, the ANC as a, as a party, knowing very well what it was fighting against, would, would make sure that um, when it runs government, it would make sure that you wouldn't find those type of uh, enemies within it who were against the democratic order. So what actually happened is that as the transition went by, as democracy became the norm, there were people that were inside the ANC that saw an opportunity in government to loot, to be corrupt, and to basically undo all of that which the ANC fought for. In that situation, who becomes the enemy? It's basically the enemy is inside the party. There's no longer some apartheid conspiracy or some security branch who used to infiltrate and kill comrades. No, you no longer have that. You now have the enemy within. And then now you have a situation where comrades are now killing each other, literally, yes. uh, for tenders yes. and positions. Just this uh, morning, as we talk now, there was a story about um, a, an acting municipal manager somewhere in the Eastern Cape whose car was basically sprayed with bullets. This type of fights, the ANC can't say someone somewhere has, is fighting us as the ANC. No, it's inside the party. If you look at how the leadership positions are fought for in elective conferences mm. and how nasty they become, um, and then you look at how uh, every procurement opportunity becomes a battle for control of state resources. All of that shows, it tells you where the enemy is. I mean, I one of the examples I make, for example, is during the state capture era, when you look at S. Van Ryan, who was supposed to be the finance minister, uh, wow. chosen and appointed by the Guptas. Mm -hmm. When they were about to take over Treasure, and he did become finance minister for a weekend, he came with Gupta lieutenants, left hand and right hand, uh, mm. who were supposed to advise him. So I say for somebody like that, who was an MK soldier, he should have known who was the enemy, who wasn't. But in, mm. in, in this case, he clearly was with the enemy because the Guptas were essentially the enemies of South Africans. They were an enemy of the constitution. They were the enemy of the entire democratic system that South Africa had fought hard for. And then here's a, an ANC, former MK cadre, now with working with the enemy basically to undo the democratic system that the ANC has established. So this is where I locate the enemy. The enemy is right there at the center of the ANC. Do you think we are likely to see the same kind of nasty fighting between the leaders battling now for the upcoming um, conference in December? Oh, no, it's already happening. Uh, it, it has almost uh, it become something like a norm. Some people would argue, for example, that the allegations... Uh, um, that Arthur Fraser is making now on Palapala, maybe part of that battle for the control of the ANC. And the argument is that somebody like him would have known about this long time ago. So why are these things uh, being raised now? This is not to say that what he's saying is not true. Well, it's still being investigated. It may well be true. It may well be untrue. Or it may well be that a lot of it is true because the president has already admitted a few things. One, that he kept money but he disputes the, the amount, 
Number wow. two, he agrees that there was a burglar, but he disputes the COVID investigation. Number three, we know that it, clearly there was no case that was open, but they, they dispute the, the detail, but the essence of the story is more or less there. So, mm-hmm. but they, they, there will be an issue about why, why are these things being, being raised now? You see, this is the problem with the ANC, that even when allegations are valid and they have to be investigated, because of the nature of the fights within the party, yeah. uh, it's no longer, you, you no longer know which one should be taken as credible or which one should be taken as part of the ongoing fights. Because we now can see that corruption basically becomes weaponized or allegations of corruption become we- weaponized against comrades. That's why there's another chapter which I deal with, which I call political insurance, where comrades use each other's um, knowledge of corruption to basically fight each other or to prevent uh, their own allegations of corruption from being made public. So this is where the ANC finds itself. They also admit that they are in trouble and the voters have begun to pick that up and they've begun to say, to express their uh, disgruntlement against the party. But my book really is to try to draw a thread of how the ANC basically dealt with corruption from the beginning up to now and how it has failed and why it has failed. So I try to explain that. That was Mpumele Lomukabela speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book titled The Enemy Within, How the ANC Lost the Battle Against Corruption.